fine dining will always have a place, um, even with like ebbs and flows of an economic crisis. Um, it's taken hold in you know every corner of the world, right? You know, you're, gonna, you're always going to have old money that's going to support it. You're always going to have this like. Uh, want to be seen attitude as well. This is just human nature. Hey there, it is Danny Valent with you and I am thrilled to be presenting another episode of Dirty Linen Food Podcast. Uh, We chat to people in the world of food, hospitality, restaurants and today's chat with Michael Wilson is a beauty. We are heading over to Singapore to talk to the Melbourne-born chef about Marguerite, his Michelin-starred restaurant in the Flower Dome in steamy Singapore. This is a really good chat. Uh, We cover the place of fine dining, the importance or otherwise of Michelin stars, uh, the way a chef at the top of his game thinks about longevity and what might be ahead. We talk about career planning, uh, how he made his moves from Melbourne to Shanghai to Singapore and the way he's thinking about what might come next. It's a really rich chat, uh, so I hope you enjoy it. Um, I, for one, will be very interested to see if I can make my way to Marguerite to enjoy Michael's food. So, Michael, welcome to Dirty Linen. Thank you for having me. It's so good to have you on the show. Uh, When I was uh, preparing for this chat and thinking about talking to somebody in Singapore, uh, I just started to feel the weather because it is so cold in Melbourne at the moment. Uh, Can you just uh, tell me how warm it is, how nice it is? Uh, I mean, it's always warm here, right? It's always hot, but it, it is, the humidity is relentless. So, I mean, sometimes like we'll escape to Melbourne um, in the winter, in Melbourne's winter, and it's just like it's it's freezing. So for the first two two days, it's great, and then after that, you're like, yeah, I'd like to leave now. Okay, <laughs> all right. So I don't need to feel 100 percent jealous. I can just think about the relentless humidity and think, oh, it's okay. At least I've got some nice, cool, fresh air in Melbourne. Yeah, and some seasons. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I did want to talk to you about seasons. So why don't we start there? I mean, I think Singapore is one of those Asian hubs where you can pretty much get any ingredient from anywhere. And as you say, the weather is quite consistent. Um, how do you think about that when it comes to menus, ingredient sourcing and looking after your dining room? Uh, well, Marguerite's located in the Flower Dome. Um, so like we're just we're surrounded by greenery and nature like you go outside and there's the water and you'll see otters and big lizards and um, jungle fowl looks like a like a chicken so there's like we're sort of surrounded by nature so that's one of our key inspirations into the way that we cook and we create here Um, it's definitely hard to say you're seasonal in Singapore but um, we follow the European seasons because we get most of our produce from Europe um, and then by following that, you know, you get a more cohesive menu. Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, how do you, how do you, how does that sit with you? Because when I think about Singapore, I think Asia, and then I sort of feel like that's closer to Australia than it is to Europe. But um, tell me about those, you following the European seasons. It's more just a, like, we don't look for produce to write the menu. The produce will like dictate what we cook. And I guess from like a, a supply and demand point, there's more access to ingredients from, from the Northern Hemisphere than there is from the South. I think when I first got here, there was a lot more ingredients coming out of Australia. But then after the COVID pandemic, it seems that it never really came back again. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I'd love you to talk about some of the dishes you've got on the menu now, just so we get a real sense of the kind of creativity that um, runs through your your menus. Um, what's the dish that you're really loving serving your customers at the moment? Um, probably this little, it's actually a canapé that we do, or an amuse bouche. It's called duck, 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 cherry. So essentially it's, um, it's a financier cake, but we make it with duck fat. And then we have a, a, a duck liver parfait or a duck liver mousse. And then we take um, the duck breast from the foie gras duck and we cure it and dry it for 70 days. So it's like a hat. And then like slice that super thin, put it on top and then cover that with um, like a cherry leather or a cherry roll up, if you will. So it's like that traditional um, formation of like duck and cherry, but it's now like chewy, salty, sweet, acidic. Uh, it's a really good one-biter. 
Wow, that sounds really amazing. Um, tell us about the structure of the menu. Like, what can people expect when they come to Marguerite? Uh, so the menu is generally set. I mean, if anyone has a dietary requirement, we'll cater to it. But um, there's like seven traditional sort of courses and then there's like a, a bunch of canapes at the start, um, some beautiful house-made bread and a, a heap of uh, mignardis and petit fours at the end. So, you know, expect a two-and-a-half-hour meal. Um, but, yeah, and some surprising stuff like, you know, we get a little bit jovial with it. Um, don't take it too seriously. I mean, like we do our best to, to make the quality as, as good as we can, but like it's not a it's not a stiff place per se. Okay. And do the chefs come to the table much? Is it that sort of place? Uh, a little bit. The uh, the actual show kitchen is in the restaurant, um, and it's not like your typical show kitchen where it's like boarded by a bench where the chefs are behind the bench. There's like three benches. But they face the other way, so you can literally see in and inside the whole kitchen. Um, and yeah, sometimes guests come up and they can walk into the into the kitchen and, and all that. So it's, yeah, it's very inviting and it's very like we wanted to strip away the sort of um, in di- the commercial feel of a restaurant because like when you when you come in, there's like you're surrounded by a garden. And then the tables are all marble. There's lots of hand, like everything's handmade, all the plates. There's lots of wood, marble, all this sort of stuff. And then we have like this shelf that runs the span of the kitchen, which has just got knickknacks all over it. So like everything from like uh, razor clam shells to a photo of my dog to an amphora that we found in the Mediterranean, just random stuff. Oh, that sounds really nice. It sounds really personal, like you've been able to bring a bit of yourself to the dining room and the experience. Yeah, it's nice to connect with people like that as well. And what's the what what sort of customers do you have? Is it a lot of travellers? Do you have regulars? How does that work? Um, all of the above. So, yeah, I mean, like the most important thing in a restaurant is your regulars, right? Um, but then, yeah, we do get a lot of... Um, people traveling uh, of the people traveling the majority are actually Australians so it's always nice when a, a, a familiar accent comes into the restaurant um, always have a good laugh with them <laughs> yep. um, so Michael you know you've, you've had such an interesting career started off in Melbourne you've worked quite a bit in Asia um, it, you know it's always so interesting to hear how chefs decide um, which moves to make can you talk about that from your perspective like was has your career been quite strategic has it just been whatever came next um, yeah give us a bit of the, back, the backstory um, I can't say I planned my career um, it was more about seizing opportunities that came my way. Um, I worked in with Guy Grossi and Andrew McConnell for some time. Um, and, you know, the, working for Guy opened the door for working with Andrew and then uh, working with Andrew opened the door for me to move to Shanghai because essentially when that happened, um, the food and beverage director of the hotel in Shanghai actually called Andrew looking for a chef. And then Andrew said to me, oh, do you want this opportunity? So then um, I was supposed to go for two years and I've just never come back. Oh, that's amazing. What was your role with um, Andrew McConnell's restaurants at the time? Uh, so I worked for Andrew at 312 as a chef to party. Right. And then we op- opened Cutler & Co. And I was a sous chef Andrew for a few years. Oh, that's amazing. And had it been on your radar to go and work in Asia? You know, a little bit like I'd heard of it and this and that, but... It wasn't like a, a, a like a, a diehard dream or anything, but then ironically, it's like the best thing I ever did because it, it's so kind of like you don't hear much about it. You maybe you do these days, but back then, it, you know, chefs went and worked in London or mainly London. A lot of Australian chefs went and worked in London. And I remember I went to London when I was like 25. And when I got there, I was like, I don't want to work here. <laughs> and, and then I, I moved to Italy and I went and worked in Italy for six months um, and I didn't work in a kitchen I worked on a winery um, as like a farmhand so like cutting vines and like helping like you know bottle wine just completely different stuff but it was more the um, how it allowed you to like see the other side of things 
why traditions are the way they are, why people's culture the way it is, and it was just it was such an invaluable um, learning curve for me that opened my eyes more, more than any kitchen has, for sure. That's so interesting. I mean, what was it about London that you had that reaction to? Oh, I don't know, I don't know if it was the accent or um, – <laughs> I remember I went into a kitchen to help. A friend was working in, in this – it was a very busy kitchen – and, I, and he's like, oh, do you want to come to work and give us a hand? And I was like, yeah, all right, nothing else to – so you walked in there and they're like, oh, not another Aussie. And you're just like, oh, God. So, yeah, I think it was just – and it looked like, you know, you wake up, it's dark, you go to bed, it's dark. I was like, no, nah, this is not for me. That's so interesting. Um, and so you went from Melbourne to Shanghai. What was that like? Yeah, I think I cried on my first day of work. Um <laughs> That was yeah. so you fly over there. You stay, for the first month, you stayed. I stayed in the hotel, um, and it was like it was tough. Like you know, you, you're going from like your home to a place where like ninety five percent of people working in the kitchen don't speak a lick of English. So that's number one. Um, so you got you've got to start learning Chinese, and then there's all this. Um, you feel the pressure, right? That was my first head chef job. So then I was I was feeling the pressure of um, things now that I think are like not that bad. There's all, the whole human resources aspect. The fine, there's a big financial aspect when you work in a company like that. Um, but you know, as you get older and you get more experienced, you know that all the numbers fall into place. Um, and then there's the 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 aspect of not having any friends, right? So then you, you've got to make a whole new group of friends. And then, you know, I made my best friends ever when I worked in Shanghai and they're from all over the world. Um, and, we, yeah, we still see each other all today, whether they're in Mexico or Scotland or Ireland or Australia as well. So, yeah, it was, it was probably one of the best things I ever did. Wow, that's so interesting. So my notes tell me that five months after opening Phoenix – um, in the Pooley Hotel in Shanghai, the restaurant and its first Michelin star. Um, tell me about that experience. Um, there, that was that was like actually uh, very out of left field. So this restaurant, like it did breakfast, lunch, high tea, dinner. It was the only restaurant in the hotel. Um, so then for, I was there for a few years before we renovated it and um, – I was actually planning on like leaving. I was like, okay, I'm going to get this restaurant renovated. I'm going to put this concept in, and then I'm going to I'm going to move on. I've been here a while now, and then like 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 you just said, five months it's open and it got a star, and it was like, okay, we better hang around for a bit longer. <laughs> and then um, yeah, we just went from strength to strength, and then and that essentially like it, it led me here because I met my business partner. He also had some restaurants in Shanghai. Um, he's Singaporean and then, yeah, some opportunities came up in Singapore to become a partner. So I moved over to Singapore. So you opened the restaurant in November 2021 and um, you repeated that amazing feat. You had a Michelin star within the first year. Um, tell me about the opening uh, opening that restaurant, you know, your first restaurant as an owner um, in a foreign country uh, with so much more to learn, no doubt, about, you know, this new place that you just moved to. What was the experience like? Yeah, moving here was um – I moved here about 18 months prior and then the whole COVID thing happened. So luckily for me, I had a bit of time to study the market and things like that. But um, one of the mind-blowing things when I moved here was just like access to ingredients. Like in China, we didn't have access to these kind of ingredients here. You can, you can get anything you want. Uh, the only thing I think you can't get here is like blood. That's it. Um, so then – you kind of, in a way, when you start using different ingredients, you have to learn to cook things again because, like, for example, a John Dory that's from the Basque Country and a John Dory that's from Australia or New Zealand, this is not the same fish. It doesn't cook the same. The skin's not the same. Everything is different. It's the, even the same with, like, flour, right? You make bread in China with Chinese flour or you make bread in France with French flour. Depending on what you want to make, you're going to get a severely different outcome. So there is like this like part of the, you have to re-educate yourself again. You have to reevaluate and 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 change all your recipes. 
Um, that's probably like one of the big things. And then what I didn't realize I was going to have to do, which I did is I actually like opened, I opened a gelateria, a casual restaurant, and then this restaurant with all within three months of each other. So that was like quite hectic. But in saying that, I did love it. So, <laughs> Quite hectic sounds like quite the understatement, but um, yeah, it's amazing uh, what you managed to pull off. I mean, it must be interesting when you're encountering ingredients and they're operating really differently. I mean, does, do you sometimes wonder how much of it is down to you or are you able to um, just, you know, uh, put everything in its right place and work out how to, how to tackle these problems that you come up against? So when you talk about like ingredients and then like finished dishes, right? <clears throat> Obviously, the the key to a good dish is having a high quality ingredient, whether it's a poached egg, or whether it is um, something creative, right? The the fundamentals are going to be exactly the same. You know, quality of ingredient, taste, texture. Um, this is the main thing. Um, we use different methods. One method is that you'll find that colors go together. This sounds really bizarre and maybe even quite hippie-ish. But, but if, the, if the color palette of a plate matches, uh, generally the flavors are going to match as well. So that's one when you, we're kind of designing a dish. But we always the first thing we always do is we, we, we get the ingredient that's in season and then taste it. And then we, we look at what flavor profile we're going to use. So once we've got the flavor profile and we're happy with that and the way the dish eats, then we'll look at the way we're going to manipulate it visually um, and, and go from there. That's how we do it. And a lot of the time we get inspiration actually from like older dishes, um, traditional dishes I should say. So for example, like we, we do a canopy, it's a, it's a ratatouille Provencal, but essentially we – we burn a heap of bell peppers on a grill and then peel them and puree them. Then we add different starches and stuff to it. And then we use a, a, a stencil and we dehydrate it. And then after it's dehydrated, we'll fry it and roll it around a, a cylindrical mold. And then we make a really dense sort of like ratatouille that's chopped up really, really fine. And then we pipe it inside. So then, but when you eat it, it's like this explosion of ratatouille. It's like unmistakably ratatouille. Wow, that sounds really excellent. I would love to try that. And on the colour matching thing, I interviewed Alan Passard once and he said a similar thing. He It was almost like, yeah, like nature does some of the work for you in, um, yeah, aligning some of those ingredients. Yeah, completely. Michael, we've chatted a bit recently on this podcast about Michelin stars. There's been there's always talk about whether or not the guide is about to come to Australia and New Zealand, um, and whether it should. Um, you've uh, you know got a f- couple of stars under your belt. Um, what do you think about Michelin, about the um, the cachet or, or otherwise that it brings to a restaurant, and whether it's still an important metric? Okay, so it's on, it's going to depend on the market for sure and the 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 public do the public want it if there's not an appetite from the public then it's not going to work right just just like anything um in a lot of ways australia kind of beats to to the to the sound of its own drum and um and it's got its own like definitive terms on what what dining is so there is going to be like this cross-cultural expectations, right, where I'm sure you've been to many a Michelin star restaurant. Um, sometimes in Australia, I don't think – I think the style is completely different. It's not to say that they're not good. They're fantastic. They're some of the best restaurants in the world. But is it, is it going to be perceived in the right way? It's not really traditional, but um, in saying that, like how transformative Michelin can be for a business is absolutely outrageous. Like when we opened this restaurant, you know, we were doing okay and then we got a star and then we were full for the next nine months. So like it, it, it is crazy how good um, the marketing is behind it. Yeah, that's really amazing. I mean, do you think it matters 
like let's say you came back to Australia and opened a restaurant, would you be sorry not to have that endorsement or the, you know, the potential of an endorsement from Michelin? Um, who knows? I mean, I don't know. I don't think so. I think that, you know, no, I don't think so. Horses for courses, right? If you want to play that game, you've got to go play it where the, where the game's played, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good way of looking at it. Um, I guess, you know, from my perspective, yeah, I have eaten in a bunch of Michelin star restaurants and um, it can be a really good indication of the kind of experience that you're going to have. But I think uh, particularly in Australia, when you think about, you know, labour laws or, you know, the cost of employing people, we, it's pretty tricky for an Australian restaurant to offer the kind of service that's traditionally considered like, you know, two or three star. Um, and so I really agree with you when you say it's about, um, yeah, it's about horses for courses and, and um, being confident in what you're able to offer in the place that you are. Yeah, I think that like even... When you, when you get into this, like, two, three-star category of cuisine, like, you, you see such a massive investment on service. Um, and then, you know, I've been brought up to date how much um, people are paid in Australia these days, and it's like, if you wanted to do that kind of, offer that kind of experience and that kind of cuisine, realistically you're gonna have to be charging like five hundred dollars for food maybe even more just because the salaries are so high are people gonna gonna go for that yeah well basically no (laughs) not very many people no right and i also feel that like like when i used to work with guy at florentino's i remember i remember a starter on the menu being 38 dollars, and i feel like now and also with Andrew, Andrew's menu is 100 and I think it's 188 bucks. I don't feel that the, the cost of these menus has, has not reflected the same cost of um, um, putting it all together, right? The same, the same cost of goods, the same cost of labor. So, like, I, I do, I think that, like, restaurateurs in Australia have actually taken a, a massive hit bottom line. Well, I've just pulled up the Florentino menu, so let's have a look. Um, yeah, so starters, a carpaccio, $40, cured kingfish, $45. Um, there's a pasta dish there for 38 So, um, yeah, I mean. We're going back 20 years, right? Yeah, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, it's. It's a tough one. Like, at some point, I'd like to come home and open a restaurant, but I think it, um, b- by that time, I'll have all the fine dining out of my system. <laughs> well, that def- definitely is something that I would love to dig into a little bit. I mean, w- where does fine dining sit with you? Where does it sit in uh, the career trajectory of a chef? And, and where does it sit in dining culture? Um, fine dining will always have a place, um, even with like ebbs and flows of an economic crisis. Um, it's taken hold in you know every corner of the world, right? You know you're, gonna, you're always going to have old money that's going to support it. You're always going to have this like uh, want to be seen attitude as well. This is just human nature. Um, I do feel that some of the stiffness of and formalities has 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 co- has come down a bit. Um, and then, you know, I'd like to see the storytelling kind of come down a little bit as well. Like, you know, when like a waiter comes to the table and every dish has a story about, you know, a grandmother or a sustainable thing. And it's like, I feel that sometimes like restaurants can forget that people are there to enjoy each other's company. Um, and it's not, it's not really a, to be honest, it's not really a popular narrative in the industry because everyone at the moment likes a story and everyone likes sustainability. But the reality is unless your restaurant's full and you're making money, it's not sustainable and you can, you know, get as many green stars as you want. But if you're not open, you can't be sustainable. And I just think that we need to pay more attention to the diner and their their wants and their needs rather than sort of, you know, pushing a narrative just for attention. Yeah, well, I think that's so well said. I mean, let's think of the diner. What do you think that diners want? Yeah. 
Um, and this is also going to change depending on your geographic location, right? Um, well, let's think about the diner. I mean, what do diners want? How, how do you still run the restaurant that you want to run but put the diner first? Um, so, you know, every dish has its provenance and all that and, and, and you know, story or whatever. Um, but we, unless someone like specifically wants to hear it, you, you, you've got to feel it out. This is where the, the front of house team have to actually be quite in check with the guest. Um, and some guests are like way more chatty than others, right? Some guests like literally want you to sit at their table and have dinner with them, <laughs> which, <laughs> which is not my favorite thing. I, don't, I love having a chat with the guests or whatever, but some, some like pretty, can be pretty full on, um, but yeah, you've just got to feel it out. Yeah. Well, what do you mean when you'll eventually get the fine dining out of your system? What's the what's the personal journey there for you? I mean, so okay, so in in life we all have like um, you know dreams and aspirations and goals and stuff, right? Um, and I have my goals within within my personal goals and my business goals and my aspirations for this restaurant. But I know that like. Um, I can't work like this when I'm 60. <laughs> it's, 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 not, it's not going to be, um, it's not, it's not going to be viable. I think that like, when I go back to Australia, you know what I really love is I like, I love your, your beautiful basic corner pub. Um, no fuss, everyone's happy. Um, and they're just, I mean, I, the other thing is too, I'm going back to something that I grew up with, right? So maybe it's like being abroad for so long that you, it, it, subconsciously it's something that one craves is to, to be around that environment again. So is it the, is it the relentless creativity or the, you know, the drive, the necessity of being creative? Is it the hours? Is it being on your feet? Is it the pressure? Like what about it, it um, means that you won't be able to do it? I, I think the most, the most, um, it's everything combined. I mean, like we, we all have other people in our lives as well, right? So you, at some point you want to, you want to prioritize other people and you want to spend more time with other people. Um, but I would say of the list that you just said, for me personally, the most difficult one, I think is, to be honest, the, the relentless creativity um, is, is, is quite taxing. It's enjoyable when you get it right, but it's miserable when you don't and you get it right one in ten times. So more often than not, you're miserable. And then people come in. And then they eat the menu and they're like, oh, my God, this is amazing. When are you changing it? And you're like, oh, God. Because uh, <laughs> there's so much, like, refinement and so much, like, that goes into it. Like, you know, you make the same dish ten times, just tweaking it to get it right. It's just, like, it's it's such a bad business plan. You know what I mean? It's a, – a lot of it is is – just like you're, you're just trying to be trying to better yourself all the time, and your team's trying to better themselves all the time. Sure, we're here to make money and that sort of thing, but geez, there's way better ways to make money. Yeah, well, it, I mean, you do make it sound really hard. Um, not to mention, you know, and not only do you need to execute it or you know come up with it and execute it, but of course you need that story behind it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How good does a chicken parma sound? Oh, whenever I'm back in odds, I have a chicken palm. I don't worry about that. <laughs> and yeah, it didn't need to be something that your your grandmother um, put in front of you lovingly after raising raising the chicken and milking the cow to make the cheese. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> um, so. Uh, how how do you look ahead? I mean, is it in the meantime when you are driving yourself like this? Are you are you looking for a second star? Are you looking um, at you know how to honourably call time on this part of your career? Like where where do you see? Oh no, we're 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 we're, we're quite a while away from calling time. Uh, <laughs> um, no, we're 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 doing our our best to try and get more accolades for the restaurant. Um, 
so the restaurant's like in its third year now. So now it's time, like we're we you know we just we just like re reformatted the furniture and we're we're taking actions. Like we do want to we do want to get another Michelin star. Who doesn't want another Michelin star, right? Um, so that's something we're actively sort of um, investing in and like. Uh, looking at our product and putting it under the microscope and going, okay, how do we improve it? How do we refine it? Um, and like, you know, the other thing is too, it's like you don't you don't know what they're looking for. Uh, you can look at other two Michelin star restaurants and go, okay, do we have a better product than that? And this happens with chefs all the time. They'll be like, oh, that guy's got three hats. I've got two, but my food's better than his. So it's like chefs are terrible for this. So um, the best thing to do is like never to really compare yourself to anyone, but just to reflect on what you're doing and go, okay, how do I, how do we improve what we do? I think you're so right and that's so well said and also speaks to why this is a <laughs> crazy game to be in. I mean, I've looked at the Michelin um, requirements and they're, they're, they're quite different to what you might imagine, um, like they don't mention service at all. They only talk about food. They don't talk about the experience. Whereas you know that from going to two and three star restaurants, that the experience is so um, critical. So, but I think that yeah, even though it says it's not about service, it's not about ambience. I mean, it is, it is because all all those things react, it, it give you an emotion to what's in front of you, right? It's, a, it's the whole the whole psychology behind the whole concept. I think is. The most important thing outside, you know, the the quality of the food. So, of course, the ingredients need to be of a high quality. The cooking has to be of a high quality, and then, of course, like the the creativity. But like creativity has to be restrained, right? Sometimes, like when things are too creative, it cannot be understood or perceived by the person eating it. So that's and it can get lost, or it's just not good. Like in reality, like to be realistic, it can just not be good. Um, so, of course, the the napkin, the plate, the service, um, it is it is it has to be all relevant. It it is all relevant. Mm. Yeah, well, it clearly is. But it would be good if you had you know a list of things you needed to tick off. Then you'd be like, yeah, it adds up to two stars. <laughs> <laughs> Tablecloths are ironed. <laughs> yeah, tablecloths are ironed. I'm waiting for my stars. Um, if only it was that simple. Um, Michael, what's your? I mean, we've talked a bit about the Australian dining scene, and you obviously come back here from time to time. Like, what's your view on the Australian culinary world at the moment? If I'm honest with you, last time I was there, my parents moved to Gippsland, and I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really go for an A-list meal last time I was there. Um, but the the time before, I went to um, the best restaurant I went to, in my opinion, was Armaru for sure. Um, and then, but Melbourne specifically is like very, very good for like re- not fine dining restaurants, but really good quality food and sharp service. Whether it's places like, you know, Tipo Zero Zero, um, Embla, I think it's actually a, a good value for money place and, like, it's creative, the quality is good, the service is, like, sharp, which is nice, to be honest. And you're not committing, like, hours and hours of your time, right? Yeah, well, you've certainly named some of my favourite places there. Um, I think we, we are lucky to have... Um yeah, really good experiences at our fingertips. Um, Michael, so great to chat to you. Um, we're speaking at the beginning of your work day. What does the day hold for you? Um, I've actually, I've got to get on a call for a taste of Port Douglas. Um, I'll be in Australia for the, for the taste of Port Douglas in August. So we've just got to get on and organise a few things for that. And then um, a bit of cooking. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> um, well, I hope I get the opportunity to try your food in Singapore. It sounds really interesting. Um, and, yeah, I won't make you sit down at the table. <laughs> um, but, yeah, wishing you all the best. Um, and that's great. To, exciting to hear that you're going to be at Port Douglas as well. We would be thrilled if you could make it over at some point. Yeah, well, I would love to. It's been, uh, have not been to Singapore for quite a while, so it would definitely be fun. But thank you so much for sharing with us today. I really love this conversation, given, given me and I'm sure the audience a lot of things to think about. 
Thanks, Danny. This is Dirty Linen, and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you.